for 15 and 20 minutes and then Danny's going to finish us off with a couple of songs get us ready for the match anyone wants to go on the bus I think there's about 10 seats left so if you see Mark in the corner he'll sort you out um, and thanks again Mark for looking after us with the bus uh, folks please give it up for Mr Joe Miller get your manager's coat off you have to ask the job to lie please um, so we had the, we had the, the Billy McNeil committee in earlier on. They were obviously they were very close. Shh, folks, best of all, they were very close to um, getting the funding for the statue. I think they were about ten grand away, um, and it's, it's brilliant that's going to be down in his, his hometown. Um, you grew up very close to the stadium. Your dad had the shop close to the stadium. Uh, you can choose Celtic boys, but you didn't get picked up by Celtic originally. No, um, I grew up in the East End, as you say, but I played with St Mary's Boys Club, where Tommy Burns or, you know, used to come down to the train. Tommy played, was a lot older than me, uh, but he used to pop in with some of the the, the Celtic players. Um, I remember Joe, Johnny Doyle and uh, I think uh, George McCluskey, a couple of them all came down one night to train with us on. John Rice used to have a, he trained in a college, but he used to run the stairs. And uh, it was a serious workout, but um, you know, in the East End, it was it was a tough place, you know, because you had to save a wee bit of energy for training. Because as soon as you left the training, once you hit that Gallagher, you had to run like in hell anyway. You're not going to be boy gangs and things like that. So <laughs> you had to save a wee bit of energy. But at that time, uh, it was just girl football was playing, so there wasn't a lot of teams watching us, and I had to go into the Scottish Amateur League. Uh, to get picked up, so we went to St Mums Boys Club, Aberdeen Boys Club, uh, Easter Craigs, and just to try and get noticed, and that's where it all kind of kicked in, and there was a lot of teams starting to chase after us. And who took you up, up the road? Uh, well, actually, it was a, an uncle of mine, I went for a trial one night, and it was an uncle of mine, Baldy Lindsay his name was, and he was a taxi driver, but he used to be Fergie's uh, chief scout for St Mum, and the two of them had a fat massive follow uh, as Fergie does, he falls out with everybody. Uh, but uh, <laughs> my uncle hadn't spoken to him for years and he says, listen, I've got a young nephew, you should take a look at him. But he actually turned up himself and I was playing for Aberdeen Boys Club up in Castlemilk and uh, he drove in the car himself and I, was, I remember it doing, it was actually chucking it down one day and he was sitting in his car right at the side of the, the park just watching us and uh, everybody said, yeah, that's Alec Ferguson. And said, well, we're all wondering. Now, back in the days, you used to see the old scouts with the bonnets and the long coats, you know, just... But he, uh, he was a manager uh, in Aberdeen, didn't he watch? We didn't know, I didn't know he was watching myself, but right after it, the following day, he was sitting in the living room and I'm playing in the streets and, and, the, and the drives down in Denison, playing in the streets, getting chased by the police. <laughs> and uh, next minute, one of my dad's customers leans out the window and says, shouts, Hey, Joe! You better get your ass up to your mass, she says. I like Ferguson sitting in your house, you know, so that that was me, I just jumped in a bus and away home. So at that time I was still waiting on I knew there was a lot of clubs looking after looking at me, but uh, I was hoping, you know I was hoping Billy McNeil was sitting in the living room, you know, so uh, but unfortunately it wasn't, but uh, you know, a wee bit of advice from my father at the time and uh, he says, you know, if Celtic wanted ba you badly enough, Billy would be sitting in the living room, but he's came all this way, watched you yesterday, and he's here to sign you today. And I was only 12 years of age. So that just shows you how different it was then, you know, when the managers are coming chasing after you. And it was the old S form system. So that tied you to the club. Uh, and uh, I used to go up to Aberdeen three, four times a year, uh, go up and do pieces and training with them. They used to Fergie and Arshin Ox used to come down to uh, Helen Vale and right across the next pitches was uh, me Bobby Lennox and Jimmy training all the youths. So uh, 
you know, I think maybe they were maybe just keeping an eye out and things when I was younger. And then obviously, you start making a name for yourself at Aberdeen, um, and like it's amazing the men with clubs, Joe, that was knocking the door. All the big ones, Liverpool, Man United, they were all interested in Joe Miller, but destination was was, was back to Glasgow. Ah, it was. I think it was. It was only cars, but you know, I thought at the time we were playing pre-season and Alec Ferguson had just left. But just prior to him leaving, they kind of hinted to me and they spoke to my dad and says he was going to take over one of the biggest clubs in Britain and uh, he would be leaving. And obviously he did and uh, I just had to knuckle down, still play away with Aberdeen at the time. I was still young, I was only 18 years of age and playing in the first team, so I was just learning my trade. But uh, he came calling and then Kenny Douglas and Liverpool, so they were always at the games, I had scouts at the games. And I thought that's where I was heading towards, going down to England. And uh, it was right at the last minute, it was, uh, you don't forget it, you don't forget the day, the time or anything. And uh, uh, Ian Porterfield was the manager and he came in and says, you're going down to sign, it was November 13th, uh, Friday the 13th. <laughs> 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 and he says, um, you're going to do it to sign for Celtic, he says, grab your gear and beat it. <laughs> uh, so, I was just packed my bag, you know, and jumped the car. But I was listening to the radio and then it was on the TV, it says that they'd already signed. And I hadn't even reached Glasgow yet. <laughs> I said, how did he know? <laughs> but what was, like, okay, the manager was in and says, right, you're, you're going to serve him. But did you not know before that? Like, had you not had talks with the no, club? No, it was the last minute and uh, I obviously had played against Celtic a few times and I scored against Celtic a couple of times. Which I nearly got my head kicked on uh, for my family and friends. <laughs> and uh, they wouldn't speak to me for about a month after that. But uh, they came a calling again and then when I did sign, the people kicked my head in and <laughs> they were at the front door cheering. So, uh, no, it was great because I was an East End boy up, I grew up. Supporting Celtic, I was always, you know, trying to catch the half-time gates or whatever. If I was playing for the boys' club in the afternoon, I would try and catch the, the half-time gates or, or get in, in, in mid-week games and things like that. So I was always at Celtic Park watching. Even, even uh, there was one day I met, uh, played for Celtic Boys Club and Alec Ferguson and we got Strike and Matt McGee were all playing and they were playing against uh, Celtic at Parkhead. And I had signed S form for Aberdeen and uh, they, they took his, uh, they said to his, you come along to the game after it, after you've played. So my dad met me and I went along and he uh, says, come into the dressing room. I says, no, no, it's all right. He says, no, come into the dressing room. Meet all the players. I says, I've met them all. He says, no, come in. So I went in and then I've seen all the boys and you're going in the dressing room, shaking their hands up, Jim Layton, Wally Muller, Alan McLeish. And we got in Stratton and Mark McGee was always sat beside each other carrying on. And we got and just grabbed me and, and shook my shook my arm, you know, really tight, and then next minute, my Celtic scarf fell right in the <laughs> And Fergie came over, they all me, and I've got a Celtic jersey on. <laughs> and he's like, ah, what the call? You know, he's cursed and swelled and everything, so, uh, you know, I said, well, yeah, we are, you know what I mean, so. Uh, he says, he's getting the tickets for, send him out to the jungle, you know. But, uh, no, it was great, but he, took, he knew I was a Celtic fan, but at the same time, I was tied to Aberdeen at the time, and uh, I, was, I was always destined to try my hardest and, and play well for no matter who paid your wages or who signed you, uh, and that was always the case. And obviously, it was, it was Billy that signed you, um, such, <coughs> such an iconic figure, I suppose, and I know you just had um, a kind of a love-hate relationship because he, he wouldn't play up front and he tried to play on the wing, and... And, and I was yeah. always chapping his door every week. No, when I, you know, when I initially signed, I said to him, you know, you always like to know things, you know. And my dad had played football, so I didn't need an agent. I was a wee bit gobby at the time as well. I could, you know, if you don't ask, you don't get. That was it. That was the way I, I you know, to sort of negotiate main deal and speak to him. I said to him, where, where do you see me playing? Because I knew you had Frank and Andy and Mark McGee. Uh, and they were saying, I knew fine well, I was desperate to sign, it was a centenary of the year. And I'm saying, you know, hopefully he's going to come down with something, you know. So he says, no, because I was playing centre forward for Aberdeen and I was scoring goals and I was just getting the knack of things. And uh, he said, 
Oh, I see. Play, play you up front. I'll play you up front. I see. I'm aware up front. No. <laughs> I'll play you through, mate. We'll spell it. You know, I want you all interchanging and things like that. So he says, I want you to start off on the right, <coughs> the mora. And uh, I says, right, okay. So I've actually negotiated. Did the deal and played me out on the right. So I think for the first eight weeks, you know, I was doing well. I was tearing defences and Andy and tearing defences apart. And, and there were two and three marking up on me. And Andy and Frank, they were banging in the goals. The crowds were getting bigger. Everybody was getting behind us. And I says to a guy, I think I was always at the gaffer's door, when am I getting the centre forward? He says, no, no, no. no. <laughs> You could be the new Jimmy Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> they were near Jimmy Johnson. I said, come on. I said, come on. No, no, no. You're, you're doing well there. Just play there, you know. So that was going on. Every week I was chatting his door. And I just got to, got to his door. No, but here is Peter. <laughs> you know, chatting. They knew it was me every lunchtime. Uh, so I, but I got on great with that guy. For you. He was brilliant. Uh, uh, we drove him up the wall. The younger ones drove him up the wall. And he was always asking the older ones to look after us and calm us down, but they could have calm us, you know. We're just a, a great squad of boys. We're all Celtic fans as well. And uh, it wasn't the so-called foreigners, the foreigners were the Irish boys. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, in, in the squad, like Ad Todd, Packy and Mitt and Chris, and, you know, that would be, you would say, the foreign boys, but the rest of all grew up supporting Celtic. When, when the trophies were finally delivered, it must have been just a huge relief for Billy. Aye. Well, we used to, you know, it was all two point system then, and uh, I think when we went up to Dundee United around about the turn of the year, and myself and Chris had scored, we knew that night we'd win the league, and to the fans it was quite, uh, but we knew we weren't going to get beat, because we, we, Big Billy used to come into the dressing room and, you know, he'd team talk, pick a team, which was a laugh, because he used to have his... Now the, the, the magnetic board, you had to be players on it, and he would just uh, move them all about. And now it's exciting, you know, every now and again he would bang the board, not the players on it. <laughs> <laughs> and then he goes up, and then he goes up and sit And then he would look and look and see who's laughing and that, you know. But, uh, <laughs> all, the, all, the, you know all the jokes are all getting cracked, you know, who's, who's getting subbed or that, he fell off the park. <laughs> Uh, so it was a good, it was good, good atmosphere in the dressing room, but Big Billy used to say is, you know, it's, listen, you should win the day, but how many are you going to win by? And that was it. And it's the same for today's team, uh, this current side. They're winning two and three and four goals all the time. And that's it, the Cavalier approach. Keep going for them. You know, don't be happy with one or two goals. Just save the one or two goals and the results for the 91st or 92nd minute, that's what it rubs it in. Yeah. You know, we, we like that, we did that often enough. Uh, but always two and three goals, and Frank and Andy were, were phenomenal that season. Particularly Frank, he worked his backside off. And, uh, but on and off the bench. On and off the bench. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know, I don't want to go there, but he dragged me everywhere, and uh, for a young boy, well, what an education that was. <laughs> uh, that was our life experience. Um, going out with Frank. Your career finishes, and but like you know, Billy Billy retires from from management as well, and you still kept in, still kept in contact with me. I uh, whenever we went, we still go to functions. That's what the good thing with Celtic players, and ex Celtic players. We still go to supporters functions, and at least I started up with former players. We're getting to supporters clubs all the time, and it kind of died a death for quite a while because. The club stopped sending the actual current day players, but it's better to get an ex-player even rather than nothing at all. So we would still go along. He said invited along to supporters clubs, and you'd meet up with the gaffer. And, you know, we all kept in touch. I still keep in touch with all the boys just now. I get a, I get a joke for Anton Rogan every week or a phone call, and uh, he's brilliant. Uh, he's hilarious, and uh, but we all still keep in touch. We're a close knit team. It was like a unique group that that squad of players. But Big Billy was behind. He kept us all together. You know, he would always make sure we were all together. He said he's going to bother. But in the end case, we always went into bother, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> but made sure that we were all in bother together. <laughs> uh, that, that, that was it, that was what he was brilliant about, and he was great at motivating us all, uh, and keeping us, you know, 
make sure that Celtic was first, first and foremost in our, in our minds and the result is Saturday and the fans. So he, he was the he was the true ambassador, wasn't he? Oh, he was, and uh, it was great to be with him. We were still even, you know, to, towards before he passed away. There, we with myself and Frank and Andy and Parky and Granny, several other boys. Whenever we were in the facility, we go and see him. So before we um, get Danny back on for a couple of songs, um, <coughs> just just oh, yeah. please just share a little memory of the Billy Rose because. Um, <coughs> The, the stuff there was just so like it, it's, it's not even like a manager it's like it's no, like it, father and kids it is I, I I'm well I'm 52 now <coughs> and it's like you walked into Celtic Park yesterday I know every step I took in I remember every game and every death I just go you know all these the carry-ons that we got up to and it was such a good time you, you've got that many memories and, and sometimes times Something just triggers you, your story and everything else, you know, and uh, it just comes out. And you know, the boys are often, often, often enough uh, phone each other. Say, what happened? Uh, remember that day down in training where Granny and Tam Burns were fighting and all that, you know? But and we were coming away with all these stories. So you don't forget anything. That's a good thing because we were winning things, and and it was such a good group of players. The gaffer was brilliant. He was he he was sat there, and we were talking about. The times we jock Steen in the sixty seven team and everything else and all the trips that they were on and the things that were happening off the park, you know, and he's sitting telling his all these stories, so you just suck it all in and say, That's oh, brilliant. But football doesn't change. There's, there's players got hundreds and hundreds of stories, <coughs> great memories, but uh, you know, you can go in the circuit and you, some of the boys speak about it and uh, it's great because the fans love to hear that sort of thing. And uh, they live with me forever, all these stories. And I, I collect everything, and all the photographs that I've got with Big Billy as well, and all the times that I was there. You never forget that. You never forget that. It's priceless. And thank you so much for coming in because it, it's so important. Because then maybe the younger generation of players won't do this because I think the distance between the fans now and the players is, is, is only getting greater. I don't think the coronavirus. Well, I don't. I, <laughs> I don't think they drive the manager up, his, up the wall as, as much as we did. Uh, the big bully had that, you know, his, and I've always said this, he used to come in and say, you know, we were sitting down and I think he took us away to Bella Medina. Uh, and they were asking about a quick story. So, he says, right, go and go out together. So we all went out together and myself, Paul McStay and Granty kind of veered off. Seen a wee pub across the road, pool table. <laughs> he goes in there and uh, we started challenging everybody at pool. So Paul, Paul thought he was the next Steve Davis, you know. He's, <laughs> he's jumping on the table, he didn't come out. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we started playing the barman, and uh, before you know it, we started playing for a carry out. <laughs> and then uh, we've got cases of beer, and we start walking down the road to the hotel. <laughs> I've got good cases of beer, bottles of salon comfort, <laughs> sombreros. <laughs> and uh, we're marching down to the hotel, and at the hotel was this, he thought, well, it was just like a kind of mirrored partition. It was a part of the restaurant, it was just all glass, and that was, you just seen your reflection. <laughs> I think the reflection was Big Bully and the rest of the team and all the directors. <laughs> Just going into the Scottish Cup final, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, oh, I said, get them on the beach tomorrow. So, I up and Billy got us up 7 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> down on the beach, running, <laughs> up and down the, the length of the beach. But uh, oh, it was great, you know. But he's like, oh, we've got a cup final, you you know, take that piss here. But uh, <laughs> Big Billy used to say, well, so long as they're happy after the park, they'll be happy on it. That was, that's the way it was. I think we leave it there, John, because I think that that's a lovely uh, <laughs> sentiment from Billy. Um, I suppose when you were happy, when you were happy on the park, and then we were happy, um, and then obviously your goal against Rangers and they, you know, cup fun and made us happy as well. Um, so, Joe, listen, thanks very much for coming in. I hope we get you in again, and thanks to the Bronx boys for coming all the way to you. Go. <laughs> uh,
starting to music, it's going to be back up to the Bill and Gill Standard Committee and to everybody who came in. So folks, thanks very much, up to Saturday.